And I had one of those pilots not very long ago tell me one of these objects was 14 feet away from his canopy as he was flying. And we had too many reports from too many qualified people, former admirals telling me something's under the water going 200 miles an hour, um, big as a football field. Putting a, a bill out like you have is one thing. Getting it to the floor for a vote is another. I challenged them to vote against it. Are we still having these encounters now, Congressman? Oh, yeah. I get reports very, very often. I, You know, I've, I've been briefed by pilots. I've had pilots pull me off to the side. I've had former, um, well, I just say former intelligence agents who have, who have confirmed many of my suspicions about this. We've had testimony that, that they have recovery units. What the heck are they recovering? On today's show... Not all UFO legislation is created equal. Many of you are likely familiar with the Schumer Amendment, the UAP Disclosure Act, which was partially passed this past year in the defense budget, the NDAA. You may also be aware that it was stripped of the review board, subpoena power, and eminent domain clause. What I don't see a lot of discussion about was the removal of updated definitions for terms such as UAP, non-human intelligence, legacy program, among about 20 others. The removal of these definitions is much more impactful than you might realize. Prepare to have your mind blown. This also affects Congressman Tim Burchett's recently proposed legislation, the UAP Transparency Act. We're going to break all this down and show you just how powerful words can be. Let's go. There's footage and records of objects in the skies that we don't know exactly what they are. Intelligence representative at a high level from the U.S. government is saying publicly, we are not alone. Greetings, beautiful people, you marvelous citizens of the planet Earth, and welcome to The Lucid Lens, where we talk about the biggest story in human history, UFOs, UAP, and the ongoing efforts to disclose this information to the public. If you're new to the channel, consider subscribing, leave a like, dislike, Uh, But more importantly, leave a comment. I want to know what you think about these stories. Where do you stand on the phenomena? Do you have any thoughts, theories, opinions? Leave them down below. And also help share this. I just want to help spread the word, raise awareness. That's the only reason I'm doing this, to maybe help educate and, you know, point out some things that some people are missing. It's called the UAP Transparency Act. Congressman Tim Burchett plans to introduce this new piece of legislation that will force the government to declassify its records related to UAP or UFOs. It's an incredibly simple piece of legislation. People have said it's two pages, but really one of those is the cover. And if you look at the second page, it's more like two sentences. And I think Burchette is thinking, let's just cut out all the words and get to the heart of the matter, which I, I, I commend him on that. But it, and if that's his you know, internal monologue, then he's got the spirit. But unfortunately, as I'm going to break down for you, this proposal is severely lacking, and this is largely due in part to updated definitions which were cut from the Schumer Amendment from last year's NDAA. So I want to point out the biggest issue first, which is the current definition of unidentified anomalous phenomena. Section C in Burchette's proposed legislation states the term UAP has the meaning given such term in Section 1683 of the National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2022. Wait, 2022? Yeah, that's right. Let's take a quick look at that current definition. Unidentified anomalous phenomena. The term unidentified anomalous phenomena means airborne objects that are not immediately identifiable, transmedium objects or devices, and submerged objects or devices that are not immediately identifiable and that display behavior or performance characteristics suggesting that the objects or devices may be related to the objects described in subparagraph A, which are the airborne objects not immediately identifiable. This is the current legislation, the current legal definition for UAP that the government, military, and government agencies must abide by. It's a very, very forgiving definition, which gives ample wiggle room for agencies such as Aero, as it allows for objects that are not immediately identifiable but are later identified to be classified as UAP. That is not good. Now, the original Schumer Amendment, the UAP Disclosure Act of 2023, as it was written and approved by the Senate before reconciliation in the House, included 23 new and updated definitions for such terms, such as close observer, controlled disclosure plan, legacy program, non-human intelligence, and finally a brand new definition for the unidentified anomalous phenomena. These definitions very clearly laid out 
what the difference was between a prosaic object and a UAP, a temporarily non-attributed object and a UAP. But it also included much more thorough guidelines on what characteristics something must possess in order to even be classified as a UAP. Let's take a look at what that new definition would have been. Unidentified anomalous phenomena. In general, the term unidentified anomalous phenomena means any object operating or judged capable of operating in outer space, the atmosphere, ocean surfaces, or undersea lacking prosaic attribution due to performance characteristics and properties not previously known to be achievable based upon commonly accepted physical principles. UAP are differentiated from both attributed and temporarily non-attributed objects by one or more of the following observables. Instantaneous acceleration absent apparent inertia, hypersonic velocity absent a thermal signature and sonic shock wave, transmedium such as space to ground and air to sea, positive lift contrary to known aerodynamic principles, multispectral signature control, physical or invasive biological effects to close observers and the environment. Inclusions. The term UAP includes what were previously described as flying disks, flying saucers, unidentified aerial phenomena, unidentified flying objects, UFOs, and unidentified submerged objects, USOs. If you don't think that a simple definition change like this would have any effect on anything, then ask yourself, why was this in 22 other definitions removed? It wouldn't have cost the government anything extra, except maybe somebody's pride. And we saw in the Joint Chiefs memo that went out to all military commands when they issued the order to report UAPs and gave them the, you know, reporting structure, what they should follow. They went by this definition. They didn't use the old one from 2022. They clearly outlined the six observables and said nothing that has a prosaic explanation should be labeled a UAP. You must go through everything. It must show these observables before it gets classified as a UAP. This definition would have immediately changed how ERA would have been allowed to talk about UAP. Everything labeled UAP would have, have to have shown one of those now six observables. I mean, there's been a lot of noise about the review board and eminent domain being removed, but the loss of these 23 very specific definitions was a massive blow to transparency. Just the updated UAP definition alone would have clearly separated true UAP from prosaic, natural phenomenon, or known human technology. It clearly would have outlined what are now the six observables or properties true UAP possess. But instead, it just means an object is not immediately identifiable, which could very well turn out to be a balloon or bird shit. It gave Arrow another year of peddling garbage around as UAP cases. But this would have meant that before an object is even allowed to be called a UAP, all this other stuff must be ruled out and it would have to demonstrate one or more of those observables. So, but instead anything that can't be identified right away gets, you know, slapped the UAP label. And who is making that, you know, is, is it the pilots that are reporting it? And then Arrow decides, oh, this, we'll call this a UAP until we can solve it. No, that's not how this works. So this is what Arrow has been doing to solve their UAP cases because these objects shouldn't have been called UAP to begin with. Do you see the problem here? So we're stuck with the original definition from 2022. And I'll pull both of them up on screen so you can you know compare and grab a screenshot and share it or whatever. The loss of this updated definition for UAP is a huge one. But we also lost language and definitions around UAP such as non-human intelligence. The term non-human intelligence means any sentient, intelligent, non-human life form, regardless of nature or ultimate origin, that may be presumed responsible for unidentified anomalous phenomena or of which the federal government has become aware. Legacy program. The term legacy program means all federal, state, and local government, commercial, industry, academic, and private sector endeavors to collect, exploit, or reverse engineer technologies of unknown origin or examine biological evidence of living or deceased non-human intelligence that predates the date of the enactment of this act. Without these clear definitions, the federal agencies, military branches, private sector, and defense contractors have ample wiggle room to flat out ignore not only Burchett's legislation, 
but even parts of the Schumer Amendment that passed. There's just way too many legal loopholes giving them a way out. So it's both a curse and a blessing that our government is supposed to, you know, be run by the book. You know, a curse because you can manipulate the law and find loopholes to avoid these orders. But a blessing because new legislation and definitions can be passed to tighten up the law and eventually cutting off, you know, all the ways they've been able to skirt around it ultimately allowing the Department of Justice and the FBI to enforce compliance. Now, let's go back to Timbershut's proposed legislation. It states, in general, not later than 270 days after the date of the enactment of this act, the president shall direct the head of each federal department or agency in possession of documents, reports, or other records related to unidentified anomalous phenomena to declassify and make available on a publicly available website of each such department or agency such all documents, reports, or other records. Seems pretty straightforward. The president will direct the government to show us all the records within 270 days. Yay! But we pretty much already got this legislation in last year's NDAA, under the records collection at the National Archive. But that legislation that passed goes much further than what Burchette proposed. It states, the collection shall consist of record copies of all government, government provided, or government funded records related to UAP, technologies of unknown origin, and non-human intelligence, which shall be transmitted to the National Archives in accordance with Section 2107 of Title 44 of the United States Code. So that right there is already more broad, including UAP, technologies of unknown origin, and non-human intelligence. That, along with the updated definitions, would have cut any wiggle room of what should be included in here. There's no room for interpretation. It's very clearly laid out. So the collection shall include the following copies of all unidentified anomalous phenomena records, regardless of age or data creation that have been transmitted to the national archives or disclosed to the public in an unredacted form prior to the date of the enactment of this act that are otherwise required to have been transmitted to the national archives after the date of this, the enactment of this act or the disclosure of which is postponed under the subtitle. Disclosure of records. Copies of all unidentified anomalous phenomena records transmitted to the National Archives for disclosure to the public shall be included in the collection, be available to the public for inspection and copying at the National Archives within 30 days after their transmission to the National Archives, and be digitally via the National Archives online database within a reasonable amount of time, not to exceed 180 days. So again, This is the exact same thing Burchette kind of proposed. Make it available online within 270 days, except this is an even tighter turnaround of 180 days. In general, as soon as practicable after the date of the enactment of this act, each head of government office shall identify and organize records in the possession of the government office or under the control of the government office related to unidentified anomalous phenomena and prepare such records for transmission to the archivist for inclusion in the collection. Then it goes on to, you know, say there's you no know, no record shall be destroyed, altered, or mutilated in any way. No record um, made available or disclosed to the public prior to this date may be withheld, redacted, or postponed or reclassified. No record created by a person outside the federal government shall be withheld, redacted, postponed for public disclosure or reclassified. So this also touches on non-government records. I mean, they really <laughs> thought this legislation out. I mean. I get it. You you want things to be very simple and straightforward, but this is not an issue that is simple and straightforward. You need this level of detail to make sure nothing falls through the cracks. So when it comes down to it, though, the president ultimately has the the authority to withhold records due in combination of Executive Order 13526, the National Security Act of 1947, and the Atomic Energy Act of 1954. Now, with legislation that was passed last year, records that cannot be publicly disclosed, they're still supposed to go to the archives in a protected, yet-to-be-disclosed classified portion of the collection. Now, this could be held for reasons of national security, but it must be reviewed periodically by the originating agency and the archivist for public disclosure. And an unclassified reason must be provided and published if it is um, postponed, so that the public knows why it was postponed. There's ultimately a 25-year deadline where you can't postpone anything anymore unless the president deems the continued postponement is necessary 
by an you know identifiable harm to the military, defense, intel operations, law enforcement, you know, uh, conduct cut of foreign relations or identifiable harm is, is of such gravity it outweighs the public interest and in disclosure. So again, either way, it, it comes down to the president. But at the, you know, at the heart of all this is the issue of overclassification. So while I applaud Timber Shet for keeping the topic and discussion going in the House you know, along with, you know, other members of the UAP caucus, this proposed legislation ain't it. The Senate is already doing a great job laying down the framework, the infrastructure that's allowing this stuff to come forward. And we know thanks to Daniel Sheehan, that new legislation is being drawn up in the Senate Intel Committee to reinforce what passed last year. What's needed next is the continued dismantling of the many layers of overclassification and compartmentalization of these programs. But legislation by itself will only take us so far. It must go hand in hand with public awareness and pressure. So if you truly want to support disclosure, continue to push for more public hearings, as that's what's going to put the pressure on the executive side and force them to finally acknowledge this. It's going to get to a point where they just can't keep ignoring it. But at the same time, we have to continue to support legislation that will further protect whistleblowers and better define the terms that these government agencies must abide by. And eventually that legislation is going to box them in and there's going to be nowhere to go but out. So at the end of the day, if you're timber shut and you want to just keep proposing legislation, you know, to keep the topic in the zeitgeist of the public, um, you know, and then conversation going with members of the House, and it ultimately doesn't compete with or harm more exhaustive legislation efforts in the Senate, well, then you do you, man. Even if you're just doing this to keep your name relevant, you're at the same time keeping the topic in the news cycle, which is one thing the House seems to be doing better than the Senate. We just don't want anything to set efforts back. So, it, there's a fine line there because the ridicule and the stigma is it's still real. I mean, there's still a very, very vocal minority that are publicly talking about this and you don't want things to go off the deep end. So they still have to be careful. So the House is, you know, seems to be doing that better than the Senate as far as getting out in the public. But the Senate is doing all the heavy lifting behind the scenes. The House are like the rowdy kids, you know, in the spotlight, keeping everyone pumped up. Uh, And remember, they were responsible for bringing forward David Grush um, in that hearing last year and having that testimony. Both sides of the Congress are actually playing their part where the Senate is quietly in the background, setting up the legislation, investigating whistleblower testimony as, you know, they continue to go to the Senate committees rather than going to Arrow because obviously they don't trust them and for good reason. While the House is staying loud and holding hearings and press conferences and, you know, showing up on News Nation every week. One to lay the laws, one to rally the public. Both of these are needed to get at the heart of this. And as long as both sides continue down this path, they're going to pull more and more of the truth out of the shadows until both sides finally meet in the middle. So, you know, if further public hearings bring whistleblowers of David Grush's caliber or higher along with firsthand witness testimony, we'll soon reach a tipping point on both sides of this effort, as well as in the public. And that's what's going to need to happen to not only allow the president, but kind of force a response from the executive side to once and for all acknowledge the reality of what's been going on. So we should be hearing about new hearings very soon now. They've, They've been talking about this a lot over the last couple of months as well as hopefully getting a peek at the updated Schumer Amendment 2.0, which is already in the uh, Senate Intel Committee. So what do you guys think? Did you know about these definitions that were stripped out of the UAP Disclosure Act? And if you didn't think they would have an impact, why were they removed? Remember, the Joint Chiefs memo to all military commands ignored this garbage you know, uh, definition from 2022, and they went with the updated proposed legislation even though it didn't pass in the NDAA. That's what they clearly define the military must report as UAP. So it seems to actually have an impact. I mean, at least there were arguments against the review board in eminent domain, but who fought against the dictionary? 
And what do you think of Tim Burchette's two sentence legislation? What reason does he have to put that forward when we basically already have that? Will it, and we will it do anything? Am I missing something? Like, the, if, if, seriously, if I'm missing something, please let me know. Um, but yeah, sound off in the comments below. I want to hear what your thoughts are on this and uh, I'll see you on the flip side.